This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Today we are discussing with Gordon Lloyd, a new book he has co-authored with Nicholas Capaldi, entitled Liberty and Equality in Political Economy. Gordon Lloyd is Senior Fellow at the Ashbrook Center and Doxon Emeritus Professor of Public Policy at Pepperdine University. Gordon, so glad to have you on the program today. Thank you, Richard. This is, uh, this is a delight. So your book, uh, Liberty and Equality in Political Economy, is framed by you and your co-author as a conversation, uh, a conversation between two, two groups um, articulating a liberty narrative and an equality narrative, and that and you know, different manifestations, additions to the narrative take place. And, and indeed, those participating in the conversation take place. You start with John Locke and Rousseau. You move forward through Adam Smith, uh, the American founders, the French Revolution. Uh, I mean, I could go through. And then we end with uh, a, a current French economist who is all the rage at this moment, Thomas Piketty. So here at the beginning, um, this idea of a conversation between a liberty narrative and an equality narrative, what is the liberty narrative? Liberty narrative in a, in a, in a boil it down. What, what's that? Boil it down for us, and you know, the well, way the way I you articulate it, it with Locke here in the beginning of the book. Yeah, well, it it, it, it really starts off. What is the unit of analysis? What, what who do we start with, and how do we begin? All narratives have to start somewhere, and they have to sort of end somewhere. We don't know when it ends, we, but we have to start with with with, um, with something. Like, for example, Howard Zinn begins the American story with 1492 in Columbus, and the narrative begins with, yeah, give me your gold off with your head, and then, and then it begins, well, we want both your head and your gold. And that, so once you start the narrative there, <clears throat> excuse me, with America being ill-founded in 1492, and you go on, and then you have to sort of answer, well, what about 1776? What about 1787? What about such and such? They, those momentous dates pale within the narrative that has been set up by Zinn, which is a narrative of execution, a history by the those who were executed rather than the executioners. But if, so we have to begin somewhere. So we begin with Locke and Rousseau rather than the ancients or the Catholic founders or the framers. And why do we begin there? Because I think Locke, well, Locke's point of departure is the individual, the autonomous individual, which in a sense defines the liberty narrative for both Nick and for, for, for both of us. Uh, that doesn't, and as it develops through Locke, the individual voluntarily associates with others and cooperates with others, but in a voluntary fashion to create society and agree to the rule of law and abide by rules that are made, but always has an exit right when the, the rule makers, even if elected by us, decide to part company with the original sort of basic uh, reason why the in, why we start off with the individual. So we start with a liberty narrative with Locke rather than say Aristotle or whatnot, because Aristotle would say that the that the, the, the community is is prior to the individual. We know from at least I do, and I think Nick does from the Catholic teaching that you, you are not the point of departure. Uh, it's um, love others, et cetera, et cetera, is the sort of the point of departure, a form of judgment. And with Plato, it's ultimately the Platonic Republic. It's not going to be a free republic. It's going to be the Republic of Excellence. So you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start, it seems to me, where, 
where the individual is placed at the beginning. So that's why Locke is placed. And, and, and how is that linked to economics? It's that private property, it, it, it seemed to Nick and me that, that, that private property is the key to understanding economics in this, in, in this beginning. Economics comes out of the household, to use an Aristotle expression, and it enters the public sphere. And in that sense, it's political, because it enters the public. Political economy in its original form for Locke didn't mean government role of economy. It meant that we're taking the economic question out of the private household and making it public. We're making it political. So political economy means that the economic question becomes very critical for the entire public. All right. Now, private property then is going to be an important drive for that and consistent with individual autonomy. If we start with Rousseau, private property is theft. And that starts a long narrative going all the way through Proudhon, who repeats that through Marx, who was not the first to use that, and on and on and on, up to Piketty, in where where private property is in fact understood to be theft, and and uh, with a softer, more gentle, from Keynes to Piketty, the issue is put as inequality of wealth is wrong. And if you start asking, well, why is it wrong? Well, private property is theft. One percent is stealing. So we start with Locke, because. You've got the individual autonomous person, both in religion, right of conscience, in in government, limited government, and private property. How do those three things sort of relate together, which we call the three pillars of liberty? Rousseau criticizes those three pillars. It's not limited government, it's a general will. And the general will can never make a mistake, and there's no exit. Um, there is no such thing as private conscience. The, it's, it's, uh, it's some form of communitarian religion. And so we have displays and whatnot. But the idea of opting out or changing a religion or doing such and such, that's out. And the idea that property is theft. So it seems to us that it's a, uh, uh, you've got to start somewhere. And so we start with Locke and Rousseau. Other people who've written on these things start way, way back. So about three, four chapters could be written yeah. on the Bible and economics, uh, Plato, Aristotle. Uh, we admit that. But what we're trying to do is to write, on, uh, write a story in which moderns are quarreling with themselves rather than moderns quarreling with the ancients. Yeah. Now, what and, does, and a, what, it, from the standpoint of the equality narrative um, that Rousseau articulates, and that you know you and you and Nick Capaldi write about what drives Rousseau crazy. The, what, what do you think really sets him off about modern Progress. political economy? Is it is it, it is something ahead. artificial? Does he find something artificial in the yeah. Lockean society that yes. isn't true? And then what is? But I guess you know what really I, I think what's so important is. Who do we think the human, you know, who does Locke, how does Locke talk about the human person, and how does, how does Rousseau talk about the human person, the nature of the person? Well, I think, yeah, yeah, well, I, yeah, well, that, well that, 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 let me sort of link those together. I think what really drives Rousseau crazy is indeed the artificial sense of progress. So when he portrays human beings entering civil society. I mean, he, he starts with an autonomous individual, but it's not, a, it's not an individual who's upset with, a, with an empty stomach and wants to improve themselves. It's an individual who is like a Labrador or something or the other and then gets corrupted by knowledge. And so there's, prior, it, there's something prior to being able to calculate, whereas I think in Locke, calculation becomes very, comes very early on. I, I, I'm going to preserve myself. And, uh, yeah. and it becomes a way of, of self-improvement. Whereas I think for Rousseau, knowledge is a corrupter. And, 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 and the peasant with Locke is sort of a, um, the barbarian or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the undeveloped society from which we must move. And God has provided the elements for which and so and ourselves, whereas Rousseau would sort of um, uh, sort of hold that 
simple peasant in, in, in a high regard, the noble savage. So knowledge is a corruption. So what really drives them crazy, I think, is that if you adopt a Lockean society, you adopt all this paraphernalia of clothes and hands, etc. So Locke, so, excuse me, Rousseau has his peasants enter society naked. And once you enter society naked, then you're all vulnerable. I mean, it's almost pre-Rawlsian in, 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 in that regard. And I think Rawls is arguing against Locke. And you might as well just say, well, let's just read Rousseau. So what drives Rousseau crazy is, I think, the, what you call the artificial, the commercial, the, the arts and sciences, which have been acquired to somehow improve the human condition through improving agriculture, uh, solving poverty, giving people some hope, whereas Locke sees that as improvement in the human condition from one of abject poverty to one of improvement through one's own autonomy, leaving others, leaving enough left over for others. Rousseau sees that as the heart of corruption. So the arts and sciences are the problem. And so you have property is theft, the arts and sciences are the problem, and limited government as portrayed through parliamentary systems, like Locke is portraying the rule of law, etc., is a farce. So get the whole community together, and a general will will prevail. And a general will is not the majority rule. I don't even know what it means. It means like a, a exchanging sentiments so that we come up with. Uh, it's very difficult to quantify. When you say, I mean, I've I've always thought of the general will as sort of the complete gift of yourself to the public thing. Yes. Something like That's that. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. So what it means is that if we were to say that Locke has, starts off with individual autonomy and tries to retain that individual autonomy through limited government and right of conscience, although it might be very difficult to retain it, you start off with that, you always have to return. If Rousseau starts off with individual autonomy, he ends it very quickly with some kind of community gift in which you give yourself up. So the ultimate then is that the egalitarian narrative in its beginning means the overcoming of individual autonomy or the overcoming of individual liberty. So there is no exit right. So the, the general will can never be wrong, and you cannot appeal to anything. You, you, there, there is no appeal. There's no appeal. Well, think about, too, I mean, it's interesting with Rousseau. You say, do we need to read Rawls even? We can just read Rousseau. So Rousseau, is he worried about inequality first and foremost, or is it something else? It's something about status. Uh, and maybe we've kind of been talking about that. It's group status. It's awareness of inferiority uh, unleashed that's by... That, well, that's inequality. That, right, but, that's yeah. right, but how is that possible unless you have inequality of wealth? Inequality of wealth. Yeah, but I, and I suppose the inequality of wealth works its way in very, or you know, has various dimensions uh, in ways in which it unfolds and manifests itself in a society, and and you know, so the distinction. So I guess I, I don't know if I'm disagreeing. I'm just since the I guess it's the amour propre uh, in Rousseau that's important here. Uh, that, well, that's sort here, of the group, here, the, here, group here. the group, the the group distinction. Yeah, class. Course, I think maybe we're seeing the emergence of class also. I think that we're, in, we're definitely seeing, by the time it gets to the French Revolution, yeah. the, only, the only way somehow to create a general will is to recognize that you have to get rid of class. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so you move forward in the book. Adam Smith adds something to the liberty narrative you think is crucial. What is yeah. that? Well, I think the crucial part is sympathy and that there is, it, it is not just that individuals have the right and obligation and capacity to take care of themselves, um, but there's something, shall we say, less rugged in Smith that is much more cooperative. That is, there's something by nature in individuals that encourages them to exchange. So it's not that there's a plan that somebody has to sit and write a plan for people to cooperate and write. So uh, it'll be four benches every so often so they can sit down and talk. It's that there's something by nature in human beings where greyhounds and dogs don't have. You don't see dogs saying, let us, let us share, let us exchange this bone for that bone. 
that dogs will fight over the bone. Human beings have the sense of what it means to be human, that is to share. So that sharing is not exchanging, is not necessarily uh, 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 sort of a, a learned act, which I think it is more in law. You learn to do it. Whereas in Smith, it's more natural. It's more instinctive. So I think the correction which Smith makes is to make the commercial society, um, shall we say, less offensive to those with sensitivities about ruggedness of the individual. So that the rugged individual is also an individual who can exchange and not just simply devil take the hindmost, which the Locke narrative clearly gets if you're looking at it through the Rousseau eye. So I think... I think Smith softens it and brings the exchange society in a cooperative society. So that commerce now becomes, just like Locke, an improvement in the human condition. But you, but it's a different defense of commerce. That and, and, and what I like about Smith's uh, defense is that. He, he anticipates that he's going to get the same criticism, even though he's even though he's softened Locke. He's going to get exactly the same criticism as Locke, namely, you've created a society of selfish, self-centered individuals who don't care about the public good. And he anticipates that, and the way in which he anticipates it is beautiful. He says only beggars are people who rely on the benevolence of others for their, for their bread, their beer, and their, and their beef. An individual operating with a, within an advanced society, which means a commercial society, takes care of themselves and appeals to the self-interest of others in the part of the exchange. So his anticipation of the critique that he is creating a self-centered individual is that he's creating a society fit for individuals who who want to be free. You want a you want a society of beggars? Then you're on your knees begging for benevolence. Yeah. So so some sort of self centered, self reliant, self appreciation has got to be there. And I think that is that is the part of the liberty narrative. And the critique of the liberty narrative is going to be it's self centered and selfish. So how does so talk about Smith and sympathy there? And how that relates to or is distinct from the idea of the self-interest uh, working innately in the human condition? Well, I think it works innately in the human condition. But I think what Smith has done is to, if I may now um, sort of anticipate the link to Rousseau, excuse me, excuse me, the link to Tocqueville, that you have self-interest rightly understood is that it may be in the Locke model, the expression of self-interest is being made against a whole feudal and monarchical and traditional network so that the, so that the individual seems to be so raw. And with Smith and Tocqueville, the idea that the individual can act out of self-interest rightly understood, which involves voluntary associations, exchanges, one's word, one's honor, um, habits, moderation. It's not greed, but it's moderation. So the new kind of, say, commercial, uh, uh, um, there are sins and new kinds of virtues. So they become commercial virtues where you know, you, you, your product is as good as your word. You will honor it. So I think that kind of thing is, is, Smith's, is Smith's correction without, without giving up the autonomous individual. The question here that, that sort of limit, well, several questions looming in my mind. One, the commercial society uh, that Adam Smith articulates, and yet he also talks about how that society for many of the workers will um, diminish, maybe that's too strong of a word, uh, but might innervate their mind or deaden their soul to higher things. Yeah. Why? They're always working. They're always doing repetitive tasks. Uh, right. And in certain respects, you know, I mean, we kind of in America, we kind of have this idea of, you know, five o'clock, it's time for a beer and a game. Uh, but in, for many respects, you know, you can kind of see this. Uh, we work hard. And then what do we do after work? Not much. Uh, do we, uh, you know, uh, enlarge our minds or our souls with art or literature? For most, no. Uh, and Smith sort of anticipated this and said it, you know, criticized it. Um, what, what, what do you think of that? What do you make of that? And does that, does that somehow mean the commercial society needs, uh, I mean, the logical conclusion, I mean, there has to be some sort of balance there 
uh, that maybe Smith and Locke and others are too quick to dismiss? Well, you know, I think your point is, is, is very well taken. And one of the questions that both uh, Locke and Smith and then Mill and others, uh, all the way to Hayek and Friedman, have got to, uh, that, that sort of tradition, if we could link them together, mm-hmm. has got to answer is what should government do? But to ask that question is to presume that that's a good question, whereas the Rousseau narrative, I think, all the way through, um, would not presume that that is an interesting question, that the presumption is that government will do things. Yeah. And, and, and probably for the good. So one of the issues that Locke and Smith have to deal with, and Smith deals with it much more extensively, his, his, his longest book is book five of The Wealth of Nations, and that is the book in which he, in effect, addresses the question, what should government do? And there are things that government shouldn't do, and there are a whole bunch of things through the mercantilist system and through the feudalistic system that government does that the Smith's mind it shouldn't do, particularly with trade and setting interest rates, and Locke would agree. But there are certain things that government should do, which is consistent with individual liberty, and that presents a huge problem. Within the liberty within the liberty narrative, as to the slippery slope, are you going too far? Can you stop it, etc. Uh, but Smith would say that one of the important roles for government is to recognize that there is this alienation within within the society. It's it's what you say. What do we do at five o'clock? Have a beer and a game, and. And part of the reason for that is that the eight hours or ten hours or whatever it is that people spend on their job is repetitive and dull. And uh, and so that when you get to five o'clock, all you're interested in is a beer or a game. And so what is it that one can do? And one answer was for for Smith was increase education of the young. And in those days, of course, people sent their kids to, to into work at age 10 or 12 or 13 in order to encourage the uh, the growth of the, the family income. Of course, well, one of the things they could do is to have fewer children. But, but, but for Smith, what you've done by sending somebody out of the workforce at that tender age is that you have not permitted them to develop their own lives. Their lives, is, their lives are set. So that if you could continue education through what we would call 12th grade, somewhere at 10th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, so that is not talking about free education at university level, free education at such and such. That's a huge extension into the 21st century. But it is, it is consistent with the liberty narrative to have people sufficiently educated that they can deal with the uh, downside of what it means to have a productive economy. A second thing is that, that the state can do is, is, uh, is build roads through counties where each county may not be able to, or, or state may not be able to, or willing to build a canal or a road, but it's in the general well-being. So there are certain... So I think one of the problems that both Locke, but particularly Smith, in his longest chapter, recognizes is that you cannot get, you simply cannot presume that government won't be there. But if we start off with a rugged individual or the individual alone, then we can actually ask the question, what should government do? If you start off or you end, begin very quickly with a community or a collective, then, you're, then the question, what should government do, is going to be an uninteresting question. And then when we get to Mill, Mill then it, uh, has another long, long chapter in which he thinks he's correcting Smith in some way, but he has to deal with, then, well, what should the government do? And he, he deals with welfare, which Locke doesn't deal much with and Smith doesn't deal much with. But obviously, yeah, another question comes up that when it gets to the mid-19th century. What do you do with all these workers? What do you do with the fact that, I mean, what, what, 
What is Locke facing? Locke is facing feudalism. What is Smith facing? Smith is facing mercantilism. What is Mill facing? The arrival of socialism. And so I think if you look at the narrative in this way, as, mm-hmm. as these corrections are due to the arrival of a different form of Rousseau or adaptation of Rousseau fighting back. And Mill then has to deal with welfare. And the answer that Mill gives is, is that you give enough to people so that they, it's a safety net, but you don't give enough to people so that they rely on it and don't go to work, which requires us to look upon work not as a burden, but as some way that we fulfill our autonomy. A question here uh, for you. You have a chapter uh, coming uh, toward the middle of the book, uh, Tocqueville, uh, Kant, and Hegel. And yeah. if thinking about the interesting, interesting thinkers here, uh, Hegel, many might kind of scratch their heads to see him as a part of the liberty narrative, yet you know right. you're, you're really talking about his book, Philosophy of Right, and, and the ways in which he describes civil society there. Uh, but with regard to Tocqueville, I mean, we, we could say what he sees in the type of order that's been launched by the liberty narrative and the incredible success, the productivity, the gains. Uh, you know, we can think broadly about, you know, the hockey stick at the end of the 18th century in which, you know, the, the lives, are, are, the material aspect of our lives just becomes dramatically greater in the West uh, of the next 200 years in uh, unprecedented fashion. And in Tocqueville, I mean, democracy in America obviously has a lot of things going on, but in the second volume, it's almost as if he says the problem with democracy may not even be so much majority will. Tyranny of the majority is a problem, but there's also democratic despotism that's, yeah. that's been unleashed. And it's almost in the way in which this, you keep talking about the autonomous individual. Tocqueville seems to be worried about the autonomous individual somehow being shut up within himself, closed off from yeah. other people, precisely because right. maybe we haven't, maybe autonomous individual doesn't really get at a full description of who we are, that we have to keep in mind the relational parts of our being and the ways in which those are sort of shaved off by a democracy. Uh, but I was curious, because yeah, reading your Tocqueville chapter, I didn't get that full sense. And, uh, but I, I was curious kind of how you thought he fit in with the liberty narrative. Uh, and also, we, we can know we've been talking about Rousseau at the beginning. Tocqueville obviously has said that uh, Rousseau was a huge influence on the way in which he thought about democracy. Yeah, well, that, that the influence of Rousseau, I mean, he says Rousseau is, a, is one of his major... Spends time uh, with him daily. Uh, yeah. That he re- <laughs> that he relies on or, or respects, and he, yeah, that that is a problem in the way in which um, uh, that Tocqueville fits into the liberty narrative. And you are quite right to point out that um, that uh, shall we say a paradox. I wouldn't. Uh, I, and uh, so how 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 is that? Uh, correct, uh, accurate critique addressed in this way. I think the way uh, that Rousseau might have influenced Tocqueville is the recognition that community is important. Yeah, yeah. But the way in which Tocqueville considers himself to be, he calls himself a liberal, a liberal of a different kind, yeah. which means that he's, not, that he's not a liberal in some kind of the way in which it has been portrayed through the Rousseau narrative, the way which is that the selfish individual, or the individual individualism, individualism, in which somebody shuts himself up, and that's known as that's known as that's some that that's a, a, um, either a, an inaccurate portrayal for Rousseau, uh, for Tocqueville of the liberty narrative, uh, portrayed by the, through the Rousseau lens, or it is true, but we have to overcome it. And Rousseau's idea of overcoming it would be you give yourself up, as you've put it so, so well in the beginning of, of our conversation, so you give yourself up to a larger community. I think Tocqueville's point would be, is there a way in which this, liber- this, this individual can come out of the dungeons of self-indulgence and, and more than egoism and join the community without giving themselves up to the entire community. So Rousseau, I think, is influential in terms of reminding the role of the community. And Tocqueville's response is, but I don't want the individual to become simply communitarian without an individual soul. And so I'm worried about soft despotism, 
precisely because I don't want the Rousseau narrative to prevail. And, and soft despotism means that the individual will no longer be rugged in the proper sense. And the proper sense is being able to take care of themselves. Now, John Stuart Mill's error, going back to Mill for, for yeah, a moment, yeah. John Stuart Mill's error in retrospect was in, in a chapter in which he deals precisely with this question, will the individual the laborer, the worker, as democracy extends itself, and the worker now is going to have more and more and more say in the running of the country, will the worker be tempted to become interested in what, what Tocqueville calls soft despotism, what Mill calls the role of the state in taking care of you so that you don't have to take care of yourself. And Mill says the worker wants the worker tastes freedom, what it means to be finally autonomous, finally taking care of themselves, they will reject this temptation to, to return to, to a democratic form of feudalism of master and slave. And, and I think in retrospect, um, Mill may be wrong, or at least Tocqueville thought that Mill might be wrong. I know we're mixing Rousseau, Tocqueville, Mill, and they never talk to each other in that same way. But this is a yeah. narrative yeah. Uh, which, in which we have license to do this. But Tocqueville, I, I think, is concerned that the Rousseau solution will turn into soft despotism, in, in, in which we now yeah. no, no longer are willing to take care of ourselves, but become sheep, and the state becomes the shepherd. And he ends on a very pessimistic note. And I think the only way to retrieve Toto from this is to say, does, is there enough that he has observed in his telling of the liberty narrative to be able to um, uh, resist what I would, what Tocqueville sees as the innate, innate temptation of modernity toward equality. This whole book, is actually based on an earlier book that Nick and I wrote, which is based on a Liberty Fund conference which was held in Tucson. And Nick was a discussion leader, and I was part of the, 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 the group. And we were talking about Tocqueville, and Nick asked a question. We well, were talking about Tocqueville and Mill and et cetera. And, and, and Nick asked a question at the beginning of the last session in which he said, if liberty is so important, why do we have to keep defending it? And I thought about that, and I put up my hand, and I, and, and I said, well, if we follow Tocqueville, liberty is not the most important. Equality is. And equality is the innate, says Tocqueville, drive, and people will give up liberty in, for, for equality. They just cannot stand privilege, or they just cannot stand the hierarchy, and they, will, they just don't want that. That's what drives them crazy. And so they'll give it up. And maybe I said that equality is a driving force. We don't have to, apparently, we don't have to defend equality. <laughs> right? Yeah. We, we don't. Right? But we have to defend liberty, which suggests to me that liberty is, is not an ape, that it requires multiple defenses from something which has a natural cost to it. And so that's part of the. So that book, yeah. I mean, that idea led to Nick and we were writing a book together which dealt with. Part of this liberty equality with Tocqueville sort of centering the issue, in which we did the 17th century, 18th and 19th century original works, where we provided introductions and let the authors speak for themselves. But we only went up to the, the end of the 19th century because to let the 20th century authors speak for themselves would be incredibly costly. University of Chicago, well, say we should go up and do 20 pages of Friedman and 20 pages of Hayek. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's $400 right there. They charge, they charge yeah. $10 a page to reproduce it. So, so you would so, say, you would say freedom, uh, thinking about uh, the George W. Bush during his presidency and the advocacy for self-government in the Middle East, uh, there was a constant refrain, every human heart 
beats for liberty and against tyranny. And I, I suppose your challenge or contest of that would be, um, well, every human heart might beat for liberty, but it certainly doesn't have the discipline and the arts and the wisdom and judgment and prudence to maintain that uh, and, and political liberty and economic liberty and religious liberty. Those things are hard and are hard won and earned. That's correct, and you and you require a certain degree of virtue in yeah. order to sustain it. You need institutional framework to reinforce it, and you need a regard for uh, how fragile it is. And it's and it's each generation has to do it. So I, my my sort of interpretation of the of the idea that that the world belongs to the living is that that the living have to make their case for liberty each time yeah. and that there is there and that there are people in the past who have made the case and it's now it's your turn to make the case yeah. and that doesn't mean to say you throw over what the previous generations have made but at the same time there are maybe in each generation a different challenge to liberty and you've got to you, you, you've got to face it, and so there's no. So that I mean, I think the challenge to liberty is, it always has to be defended, and that somehow equality does not. And in terms of George Bush, I do think I do think uh, that, that um, even though Locke, in, in terms of his imagination, can imagine a state of nature in which there's this autonomous individual. By the time you get to Mill. He's dropped that state of nature argument yeah. as uh, a, a too fragile a ground for defending liberty. So he defends it on utilitarian grounds. Yeah. But he, he, Tocqueville cannot defend it on natural r r right grounds completely. So he turns to a different kind of utilitarianism. So that when you get to Hayek, he's, Hayek collapses collectivism and communitarianism and say there's really only one situation, um, control or choice. So that he, yeah, then you've got different sort of philosophical justifications for it. But I would say with, with, with Bush, is that despite what Locke says as an autonomous individual, I think there's an infrastructure which encourages liberty. That, for example, the the idea of demolishing a long history of primogeniture and the distribution of private and the distribution of property, not based on merit but based on firstborn. That has to be that has to be dealt with, and Locke dealt with it, and the American Revolution dealt with it, and that that encourages a whole different kind of of, um, of society, in which the presumption is in favor of private property, and the state then has to make the argument as to why you shouldn't. Uh, with with Rousseau. The presumption of private property is not there. The state permits you as the state sees the, the general will permits you as the general will sees it. So even though liberty may be in the heart, it requires some kind of guts, luck, moment to end primogeniture. I don't think it's an accident that within a certain 200-year period that you've got an assault on primogeniture in the economic world. You have a critique of the divine right of kings in the political world and the introduction of consent as the basis for legitimate government rather than firstborn, right? And you have a critique of the Catholic Church and, um, and indulgences, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't think it's a, a mere accident that these three phenomena occurred uh, pretty much within the same time. And then you've got the background of the Renaissance. And, and so that I don't think that the even though liberty may be in the heart of people in the Middle East, that, that you don't have that infrastructure to challenge thousands of years yeah. of bowing on your knees where liberty may be planted in their hearts, but it's not planted in their feet. It's not planted in their mind. Yeah. It's not planted in in their institutions. I thought you know, maybe you know. Of course, there's also just the uh, the whole idea of 
the inability to um, separate a sphere for law uh, for the public thing apart from Islam seems to me the biggest challenge and, and one that was just ignored by the Bush administration and thinking that they were going to you know, have locks uh, materialize in the desert. So you've been saying something interesting. The individual or the individual order, the free society of individuals, what have you, has to be constructed by politics. Uh, it, it has to be constructed by law. But that, of course, means, I, I think, uh, some things could be forgotten or left out that are crucial or which may open up, uh, almost in a dialectical sense, the liberty narrative, narrative to problems, uh, to challenges. One that seems to me, just thinking about your chapter on the New Deal, uh, or you, know, you group yeah. together Charles Beard, the progressives yeah. and the New Deal, but, right. you know, a critique that emerged in the middle of the 20th century from a thinker you know very well, uh, Leo Strauss, uh, yeah. something like uh, the liberty narrative secures bodily rights and secures property rights. So we've got a low level of, but sturdy, uh, political level of agreement that could you know, lead to human flourishing, but yet can also be, I mean, because, of, because precisely because it is so low, Progressives and those articulating the equality narrative, even you know someone like Piketty, can come along and say, "Well, no, we're going to protect your bodily rights and your property rights, uh, but we're going to make it better because we're going to raise up the political contract to include equality of outcome, to include uh, just distribution or more more just distribution of goods. So we'll bring more people in, uh, and and that'll be more just and it'll be more humane." And so you need us, and, and we'll actually save democracy, et cetera. Uh, is that a problem with the liberty narrative, that it's ultimately unwilling to ascend to higher, higher loves or, or something beyond you know, what Strauss called the joyless quest for joy? And that's just a contradiction within it. Yeah, well, uh, I think... Um, I think that the idea that there is a public good out there has attracted a number of scholars, both ancient and modern, postmodern. Let's let's put it that way: ancient and postmodern. And the attraction of Plato's Republic is immense, and particularly to Straussians, that you could end up with a possibility of a. Of, of a perfect regime. But if you take a look at that perfect regime, liberty has very little place in it. And there seems to be very little concern. So that a regime, through the Straussian lens, I think, a regime which is dedicated to liberty is an ill-founded regime or an incomplete regime. It is probably uh, an adamantus regime in terms of the characters or uh, potentially maybe even a Glaucon regime, but it is not that moreover the temptation of the republic so the one temptation is that there's something called a public good which can be discovered which is higher than individual liberty and ought to prevail over over that over that and it is there and it can be discovered postmoderns also have an idea of 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 public good which is to be set by experts so the chapter on the new deal of progressives on beard and then on to piketty uh, through keynes is that the problems of the world are so big that they cannot be handled by consent of the government, the limited government. But um, we now have, the, uh, to use an Engels phrase, uh, politics has been replaced by administration. So that what we need now is no longer entrepreneurs, but what we need are administrators. And Madison made this comment on Federalist 10 that enlightened statesmen may not always be at the helm. And I think the progressive tradition all the way through Piketty is, well, enlightened statesmen may not be always at the helm, but enlightened administrators will be. And so if enlightened administrators <laughs> discover through Keynes that, ma that macroeconomics is what you need, then that's what you're going to get. And so there's this idea of the public good. So in a postmodern kind of world, which I've lumped together a whole bunch of people, so I've called Strauss the ancient. Modern is going to be, say, the, the, the founders of the liberty narrative. The postmodern is going to be this idea that there is a public good. Yes, it can be discovered by enlightened administrators. Yes, excellence is going to rule. 
and consent and liberty fall by the wayside. So yes, there's going to be criticism from those who love the ancient world, who see the modern world as somehow defective, who then would see postmodern as a natural fulfillment of the modern. I think that's a Strauss understanding that uh, the joyless quest for joy, etc., and on to Nietzsche, etc., that, that the three waves of modernity is that, is that once you start with Locke, once you start Locke off, then you get Marx, etc., that there's, there's, there's not really a debate within modernity. And what this book that Nick and I have, tried, have written is to try to create a debate within modernity. That that um, that that debate is in our mind just as interesting or more interesting than take than trying to incorporate the ancients as the standard by which we judge modernity. We judge modernity from within modernity by one of the standards: the liberty narrative or the equality narrative. And yes, the equality narrative can be critiqued on the ground of the public good, either from the ancient world or from the postmodern world. And it's going to be imposed. And I think that has to be the defense from the liberty narrative, that we're only going to voluntarily agree to something rather than have it imposed. But it is good for you. I don't want it because I'm free. Well, sorry, you can't be free to be fat. You cannot be free to be stupid. You cannot be free to do such and such. That is beyond, that, 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 that's beyond the pale. And uh, what's, got, what's that got to do with equality? Well, no one is going to be left behind. Every child is going to be such and such. Every person. So this egalitarian everyone business is now the standard of the postmodern. Everyone is not the standard for the Straussians. It's the best one. So if the best one cannot survive, then the regime is, is, is ill-founded. Um, I disagree with, with two of my heroes, which are, which are Martin Diamond and Herbert Storing, concerning the American founding. I do not think that the American founding is ill-founded. Um, I think it is, I don't think they pursued a perfect union. I don't think they intended to secure the finest and the surest public good. They intended to secure a more perfect union. And the only way to secure a more perfect union in a democratic republic is through consent and through argument and compromise. And that it does not necessarily result in the perfect public good, but it does, it does result in uh, an attachment to the rule of law and a process by which some approximation and Madison's answer in 51 is that if you devise this, if you devise the institutions in such a way that the majority's voice goes through the legislature, then through the Senate, then such and such, that it will that the that the, the, the outcome is is very likely to coincide with any public good. And that Adam Smith, for somebody to sit down ahead of time, this is right after his invisible hand remark, for somebody to sit down ahead of time and say, this is a public good and I'm going to Im implement it, don't listen to that person. Run. So this, 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 this idea of the enlightened administrator or the enlightened philosopher seeking the public good does provide a critique of the liberty narrative. But the liberty narrative has to fight back and say that liberty is the criteria for life and it creates a more perfect union for far more people. And by the way, this conversation wouldn't be taking place in a platonic republic or a postmodern public good. Or you wouldn't have anything to redistribute in the first place. Yeah, well, right, you certainly <laughs> wouldn't want to redistribute. You wouldn't want to redistribute my ideas. Yeah. <laughs> no, your ideas we could redistribute, Gordon. Gordon, thank you so much for joining us. We've been uh, okay. talking with author Gordon Lloyd. Uh, his new book, Liberty and Equality in Political Economy, co-authored with Nicholas Capaldi. Thank you so much for your time, Gordon. Thank you very much. Good questions, and I enjoyed it very much. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.